Hi, I'm James Dunn. Welcome to the Inside Network. Welcome to In Depth, and my guest today is Christine Todd, Senior Managing Director and Head of Fixed Income US at Amundi Pioneer Asset Management. Hello, Christine. Hello, thank you. Please talk to us about the Amundi Pioneer business. Just for, for those who aren't quite familiar with the pioneer aspect of, of Amundi, tell us uh, what, what that entails. Sure. Amundi Pioneer is the US presence of Amundi, which is a top 10 asset manager in the globe with $1.7 trillion under management. Um, we have six hubs across the globe and operate in 37 countries. The approach at Amundi Pioneer, where we manage $90 billion of assets, 50 billion of which is in fixed income, is uniformly a relative value approach driven by bottom-up fundamental analysis using active management to deliver excess return. And it's really the asset allocation, the sector rotation, and the security selection that is the attribution for our excess returns. Um, we also incorporate some element of macro views and quantitative analytics to round out our skill sets. How about um, you give us a, a quick overview of the US fixed income market at the moment a, a, as it stands and, and how those uh, strategies that you oversee are, are, are playing out and where some of the really strong opportunities are? Mm. Well, the US fixed income market, very, very broad and very deep with lots of idiosyncratic opportunities underneath the umbrella of the $46 trillion market, which has grown, by the way, 20% over the last five years. And 40% of that market is US treasuries or US, tre US agency bonds. And 20% is either mortgage securities or corporates, and 10% is state and local government debt. Very big market, almost four trillion. And less than 5% is asset-backed securities. The thing that's notable about this year is the massive issuance that has come and been absorbed readily by investors in US fixed income. And that would be primarily in the mortgage sector, and that would be the agency mortgage sector, and in the corporate bond sector. It took a little while for high yield to start get, to get the engine going, um, but US corporate issuance is about double what it was uh, versus this time last year. And it still goes without saying that it's the deepest and most liquid financial market in the world? That's very true, but where we find the greatest values are in the pockets where liquidity is more strained. And these could be markets where there's complexity relative to structure. So that would be in the securitized area or complexity relative to credit analysis in the corporate and high yield markets. We also, even though they're incredibly deep and liquid, the agency mortgage market we have special skill there dating back 30 years to understand duration and prepayment risk such that we can actually add excess return in government backed bonds. Mm -hmm. So how is that offer different from the uh, other US based fixed income strategies that are offered by your competitors? You mentioned you're a relative return oriented house. So you obviously keep a very, very close eye on, on competitor offerings. So, so how do you differentiate yourselves? Very much a relative value, sector rotation, and security selection, bottom up approach. And where we're really able to add that extra alpha is because we have, we leverage the experienced team 
in the US as well as those across Amundi. So we have boots on the ground all across the globe. And that gives us a distinct advantage as well the strategies that we manage aren't of a size where relatively small incremental positions don't make a difference. So even for example, in the insurance linked notes market, which is only a hundred billion, we can have two and a half to 5% of ILS and manage dedicated strategies and still have that deliver impactful additional return to the portfolios. Similarly, in the securitized market, there is a young and growing uh, market called credit risk transfer, which after the 2008 crisis, Fannie and Freddie were required to outlay some of their risk in order to continue to underwrite mortgages. And they do so in the form of these credit risk transfer securities. Again, a small market, which wouldn't make a difference to a massive player, but we're pretty contained at only 50 billion. So we can look at the loan level data and understand exactly what we're buying and understand exactly what the upside as well as the downside is. So these smaller pockets of the market, Christine, that you mentioned, uh, and playing in those, uh, what, what are you trying to do there? Are, are they definitely seen as uh, return contributors or, or more as a, a diversification aspect for the fund? Both. The correlations with other parts of the portfolios are very low. So anytime you're um, adding a non-correlated asset, you're improving your risk-adjusted return. Now, in certain markets, the purpose of these securities would be the carry because of the high level of income that they're delivering. But post-corona crisis, these offer compelling levels of income as well as an enormous opportunity for price appreciation. And some of these markets, because they're less readily traded, haven't rebounded, like for example, 30-year corporate credit in the investment grade area. So there are still bastions of great opportunity left in the US markets, and those, those are the ones that have really been left behind so far in the recovery of US fixed income. You mentioned, Christine, the, the Green New Deal, and I'm just wondering whether uh, California is providing for the United States uh, a bit of a warning about um, trying to rely on renewables before they're capable of doing the job. Well, I mean, the state budget in California, when you, when you um, compare it to other states and the way that they can manage their costs and manage their uh, revenues, gives them a lot of financial flexibility to invest in subsidies in these areas. So I think that that kind of financial flexibility and their commitment to um, making the world a cleaner place um, is a noble thing that can be pulled off. They have levels of debt that are manageable when you count pension obligations, bond debt, and other than pension liabilities, such that there is the opportunity for debt issuance to support some of these programs as well. Americans though, not comfortable thinking of their country as uh, the first of the first world with blackouts. No, that is uh, unacceptable. The only really other place we've seen that is in Puerto Rico. Um, intermittently uh, over the years, we've seen it in New York. Uh, and that would be a function of the power grid and the weather. So uh, I would say it's more that to blame than it is the goal of uh, cleaning up the system. Okay, let's move away from talking about that smaller aspect of your portfolio and into the, the, the broader risks around the portfolio. And particularly, it, it, it can't be avoided, the, the US political environment. What, what do you feel are the potential market outcomes for 
each scenario of uh, tr Trump gaining re-election or, or the Democrats winning and, and, and the extent of any Democrat win in terms of taking the legislature. So, so coming out mm -hmm. of the election, what, what, what kind of risks um, are you looking for and even opportunities on the other side of that? Well, to set the table, um, the, the outcome is currently predicted to fall in favor of Joe Biden. The betting sites, which are really real time, you know, real capital being attributed there, expect that um, Biden will, has a 59 to 45 favorite. Congressional sweep on the betting sites is a 55, 35 Democratic sweep. So that is very important because legislation occurs when the party in the White House commands both chambers. Otherwise, you see a lot of gridlock. So there is tremendous opportunity for Biden's platform to be advanced if that does, in fact, prove out. The traditional polls put Biden at 50 versus Trump at 41. Now, what I would caution is to watch out for the sneaky enthusiasm gap. And what this is, is that 58% of Biden voters are not voting for Biden, they're voting against Trump. So that leaves Biden's base a little vulnerable because it's not fundamentally him and his policies. It's just the antithesis of his competitor. And that is something that can be very volatile in terms of its outcome. Now, if Trump is in the White House, we'd expect to see uh, more of the same policies. He hasn't signaled any changes. And that would be lower taxes um, and less regulation. This has been very stimulative for the US economy. And the markets have responded very favorably. Uh, if you look at, for example, the regulatory cost that the private sector has saved going from the Obama era through the Trump era, that's upwards of $90 billion. And that can be deployed in investment, and it can be deployed in paying down debt, can be employed in very market-friendly manners, and it has been. Um, using the tariff as trade policy has created a lot of volatility in the markets. Lately, very surprisingly, the markets have shrugged it off, but you would expect that over time, the markets will become fatigued, and that kind of volatility you'll see in response to that, that uh, approach. Now, it, you know, under his leadership, for better or worse, unemployment reached its lowest level in 50 years. And GDP rose to almost 2.5%. And, and employment participation started to edge higher. So things were pretty good. Um, now, the question with Biden is counterbalancing policies. Which one will prevail? to either do damage to the economy and the markets or to stimulate the economy and the markets. So you've got increased regulation. Under the Obama era, the regulatory cost cost private companies double what they were burdened with coming from the Bush administration. He's talking about taxes going up and we're talking about corporate taxes, individual taxes. We're talking about wealth taxes. We're talking about increasing capital gains taxes, raising them, reducing deductions and tax credits. So this is a pretty heavy burden. And I've seen studies where the result of that definitely hurts equity market valuations because discounting the lower profitability means that your stock price is lower. Also, some estimates have GDP specific to this policy going down one and a half percent, taking one and a half percent out of otherwise what would be GDP, wages going down a percent, and jobs actually coming down by over a half, uh, half 500,000. We'd expect that with his policy um, pushing up minimum wage, wages for teachers, things like this, as well as a $7 trillion spending package, you'd see some inflation igniting in the system. And that's not a bad thing. The Fed has struggled mightily to push inflation up. And that would be actually welcome uh, in the economy and by the Fed. 
Uh, we'd, we'd probably see Biden working more towards rebuilding our alliances and having softer rhetoric, even with those that were um, addressing more confrontationally uh, and backing off of using tariffs as a weapon. That would be for markets because um, the volatility would be muted in response to less uh, risk. So when I said, you know, it's really the counterbalancing factors of his policies. What I'm really referring to is, does the Green New Deal look like FDR and his success, or does it create zombie institutions, companies and universities? Does his Build Back Better platform, does that create stimulus, or are we crushed under the burden of taxes and regulation. Finally, I'd note as a side uh, comment that we've heard Biden be very vocal about the role of the Fed. And I think it bears watching if he does come into leadership, whether he tries to expand the mandate of the Fed beyond um, inflation and employment to income equality. He's mentioned it and the Fed governor is concerned about it. So it bears watching whether this uh, affects the purity of the Fed mandate. Thank you so Go much, ahead. Christine. I found that fascinating. <laughs> I felt really comfortable and um, you were very gracious. Thank you. Mm -hmm.